You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock. Welcome to In Pursuit of Development, and I hope you're enjoying Season 5. In today's episode, we're diving into the web of globalization, a force that has transformed our world in ways both remarkable and challenging. From the historic wave of trade liberalizations in the late 20th century to the monumental rise of China, an intricate interplay of a range of forces has molded the interconnected nature of our planet. And along the way, we have witnessed the decline of manufacturing in advanced economies and the far-reaching impacts of trade on global poverty, inequality, and labor markets. Now, despite a rapid advance for two decades, globalization slowed after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. But the interesting thing here is that it did not come to a halt. Indeed, data on trade, capital and immigration flows indicate that globalization continued, although at a reduced pace, even during the COVID-19 pandemic. But we've also witnessed in recent years a backlash against globalization, particularly in some of the world's largest economies, including two of globalization's bastions, the United States and Great Britain. So is the world economy deglobalizing? Is globalization in crisis? And are we witnessing the beginning of a new era? To explore the multifaceted world of globalization, I'm joined by Penny Goldberg, who is the Elihu Professor of Economics at Yale University and the former Chief Economist of the World Bank Group. Penny was recently in Oslo to deliver the wider annual lecture, wider as in the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research. We used that opportunity to engage in a discussion centered around Penny's latest book, The Unequal Effects of Globalization. If you enjoy listening to this show and believe in the power of the conversations we are having, I would be very grateful if you could rate the show, leave a comment, and consider sharing the podcast on your social media channels. Let your friends and family, colleagues, and students know about the show so that they also can be a part of this journey with us. Thank you. Benny, it's great to have you in Oslo. I'm looking forward to your talks. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you. It's such a pleasure to see you. Welcome to the basement. Uh, Thank you very much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, Globalization is, of course, one of those buzzwords. Everybody Mm -hmm. has an opinion about it. And in relation to development, in relation to poverty, inequality reduction, the jury's still out. There's a lot of disagreement, or maybe some people agree, on whether globalization was good, whether it was bad. So I'd like to ask you to begin with, how do you understand this concept, this term globalization, and the extent to which you think it has contributed to reducing world poverty, world inequality? This is a very interesting question. Dan, as you said, globalization is a very broad term. And it doesn't refer to a phenomenon that's new. We've had globalization since ancient times. We've had trade or movement of people or migration since the beginning of of humankind. Usually when people talk about globalization these days, they refer to to what has happened since 1989, so since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that's an era that we often characterize as the era of hyper-globalization or very fast globalization. So what do we mean by that is that countries decided to engage in an exchange with each other, mostly an economic exchange, but not only economic, also cultural exchange, based primarily on a notion of well-being and prosperity, rather than based on political systems or national security concerns. So the United States engaged in relationships with China or even the former Soviet Union uh, with Russia and other countries, independent of differences in political systems or ideology and so on. 
And during th- this time, we have very fast growth of international trade. So if you measure trade as the total world exports, these exports increased more rapidly, faster than world GDP. This is something unprecedented. So you can see the graphs in my book. You see that this is a period unique in history. We, we've had other times when trade grew very fast, but nothing compares to what happened between, let's say, 1989 and 1990 and the onset of the global financial crisis, to 2008-2009. And so this is a period where countries um, actively engage with each other on many fronts. Has this been good for poverty and well-being? I would argue definitely yes. I think there tends to be consensus on this issue that if you focus on what I call in the book global inequality, what, what do we mean by that? We mean if we, for a moment, ignore borders and we pull the population of all countries together across the world, and we ask the question, have differences across people, have have these differences declined over time? The answer is definitely yes. Over this time, you see a clear reduction in these inequalities. And the main reason this is happening is what happened in Asia. So primarily in China, but it's not just China, it's also Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, many other countries. And this is not the kind of issue where you can point to clear econometric evidence or to a clear empirical study that shows that unambiguously. But mm. if you take if you if you take the accumulated evidence together, and by that I mean strongly suggestive correlations, anecdotal evidence, h- historical episodes, if you take this all together, there is very strong evidence that globalization contributed to that. So for all these countries, being part of the world economic system uh, was something that helped them reduce poverty and overcome many constraints to developments. So all this started slowing down after the financial crisis and has come pretty much to a halt in recent years for a variety of reasons that I explore in the book. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it was the end of the Berlin Wall. There was this period of optimism. Francis Fukuyama wrote about Mm -hmm. the end of history. It was this idea that, you know, democracy had won that uh, one should be more mm. open. So I think there mm. was that willingness to cooperate with with even you know countries that you did not cooperate with that, that much before. I, I see that that kind of optimism led to perhaps greater trust in multilateral uh, processes, mm-hmm. collaboration of different kinds. And for me, globalization is not just the economic aspect, mm-hmm. it's also the political awareness mm-hmm. of how things are, you know, what, how things are in other parts of the world. And that's mm-hmm. where technology also comes into the equation. Suddenly we felt that it was a global village, that we were all close, to, we were traveling easily, it was cheaper to travel. But I was actually thinking about, while reading your book, Penny, when I first came into this country in 1991, 32, 33 Mm -hmm. years ago, how expensive it was to call my parents back home in India. It was just super expensive. And now it's free. uh, So it's on FaceTime. It's just free all the time. And you have video in addition. So this awareness, culture, politics, but also economics Mm -hmm. for me is globalization. But Getting back to the the debates, I sometimes felt that when I read the literature, you could have an academic agreement, but there are all sorts of uh, other social movements, activists who would argue, even in a country like India, say, that globalization was good perhaps at the macro, the global level, but within countries, you Mm -hmm. had some people benefiting more than others. And that is also something I read in your book. So I'd like you to please elaborate on that. Who were the winners, let's say, in that first period of hyperglobalization? Who were the winners and who were the typical losers in your view? That's a great question. And that's something I point out at the book. You know, why do why did we see such a backlash against globalization if it had been so good for the world? And first, before I come to the bad, <laughs> let me point out what you just said once again, that apart from reducing global poverty in many parts of the world, you know, predominantly Asia, the other huge virtue of globalization is it allowed consumers all over the world, including in rich countries, it allowed them to have access to cheaper products That's produced correct. in other countries at a lower cost. So we had more variety and we had lower prices. And that that's not just trade, right? That's, that's not just globalization. It's the combination of technology and globalization. However, at the very same time, 
there were pressures on the world economic system coming from within countries. So we know anyone who has studied trade knows that trade generates winners and losers. This is a basic insight of economic theory. This is not a a, a position of some radical groups. Hmm. Uh, Every mainstream economist knows that. You know, during this period of globalization, many economists feared that what was going to happen is the the low wages in developing countries were going to indirectly put pressure on labor markets in advanced countries because indirectly workers in a country like uh, Norway or Sweden, Europe, and of course the United States and Britain, indirectly they were competing with workers in China or Vietnam who were paid much less who had no labor standards, were willing to work very long hours for nothing. And so there was this fear that the conditions in these countries were undermining the gains that workers had achieved in many advanced countries. So these fears emerged firstly um, in the 80s and in the 1990s. So during that period, we saw in many advanced countries what economists call the increase in the skill premium. So that's the wage gap between workers who have skill, skill in this context means education, mostly college Mm -hmm. education, and those who did not. And it was very natural to think that this was related to globalization. Now, there has been a lot of work on this topic. I contributed to that along with other people, and we didn't find any evidence that this was the case. It was true that um, the skill premium was increasing, but it was very hard to connect it trade. And part of the reason I really believe this result, as academics, we always like to publish positive results. We we like to publish (laughs) things we find. When you say, I didn't find anything, it it gets much harder to publish it or get any attention. It's not attractive enough for a journal. It's not attractive. So this is a case where many people from many different fields, from labor economics, from international economics, were working on this topic. We couldn't find any robust evidence. And then we were writing all these papers where we said, sorry, we tried very hard. There is no evidence. It made it much harder for us to publish in top journals. So just to be clear, you didn't find evidence that globalization contributed to the, the increase in the skill premium. So, so in some cases, we would find a statistical relationship, but the magnitudes were too small compared to what technology had done. Now, all this changed around 2000, the year 2000. All of a sudden, the consensus changed and people started finding a relationship in 2000. What changed in, in 2000, in the early 2000s? So one viewpoint is that what changed is China had entered the world trading system. So it used to be the case that many countries were getting their imports from low-wage countries in Latin America or, you know, the East Asian tigers, but they were too small to matter for labor markets. But all of a sudden, we have China. And with 1.6 billion people, it matters because of its size. So this is one viewpoint. Another viewpoint that I think is equally important is people started looking at the different dimension of inequality. So not the skill premium anymore, but they had started looking at what trade and globalization more generally had done to differences across communities Mm. that had been differentially exposed to globalization. So within the United States, which is a large country, compare those communities, those cities or counties that had been exposed to a lot of competition from China to those who had not. And people started finding very stark differences across space. Now, this was not unique to the United States, because for the United States, you may still say this was China. But they started finding them in other places, like India, that was not exposed to the same kind of pressure from China. Brazil, Vietnam, so many countries that had not faced the threat from China. And and so the new insight, and I think this is an important insight, is that really where we were seeing the pressure was in the the increase of spatial inequality, geographic inequality. So inequality across communities. And this matters. Perhaps it matters more than inequalities in the labor market. Why does it matter so much? And this is something I talk about in the book. It's because it's not just the labor market. Then there are knock-on effects on every other aspect of 
economic life and, and life more generally. So those communities who were exposed to more pressures, they saw more unemployment, they saw more welfare payments, then they saw more crime. In some settings like India, they saw less improvements in reduction of child labor, h- higher instances, higher cases of mental health. So communities started falling apart. So, so this is the kind of inequality that I, t- that I talk about in the book. And this was a new insight in economics. Now, as it turned out, this type of inequality had also very important political ramifications in the United States and also in Britain. In Britain, we had the same kind of divide between the area around London and southern England and northern England. And this created enormous pressures within the countries. So then we saw the rise of this anti-globalization sentiment. In the United States, it was primarily against trade. In Britain and Europe, it's it's about immigration. But it's it's part of the same issue. As you said, it's not that the average person, that the average consumer had been made worse off by globalization, but it is the case that specific communities, that groups of the population within these countries had been adversely affected, and these groups were pushing back. So but as I see it, Penny, I mean, most of the sort of criticism or dissatisfaction with globalization in recent years has been in our parts of the world, in the advanced mm-hmm. economies, because of this fear that we're losing our jobs, offshoring or outsourcing basic services that could have been done here because, as you said, it's cheaper in Vietnam, India, China, wherever. So much of that dissatisfaction is in our parts of the world with globalization. And this, of course, fed into the political discourse, which Mm -hmm. led to Brexit in the UK, the, Mm -hmm. the election of Trump in 2016, etc. But if we were to go back to, say, the developing world, Mm -hmm. low-income countries, I'm just trying to understand who you think were the winners and losers there in the Indias and Chinas. And I've had many people on this show talking about certain entrepreneurs being Mm -hmm. able to, you know, suddenly in China, there was so much more freedom to actually do business from home, you know, selling, Mm -hmm. you know, knockoff products or wherever. So globalization opened up new opportunities for certain groups. A lot of uh, young, very highly educated Indian college graduates were suddenly working for these uh, companies, these mm-hmm. uh, what are they, those call centers. So you saw something happen in terms of tourism, in terms of certain sectors in these developing countries. But there were also others claiming, this was a few years ago, farmers were losing out that the agricultural sector perhaps did not do as well. So mm-hmm. within these parts of the world that I'm talking about, not just in India's and China's, but also say in Africa, do you think globalization, I mean, obviously at a macro level, it did well, but mm-hmm. could it have done better? Was there also dissatisfaction in these parts of the world, not just in the richer countries? So it's certainly the case that inequality increased also within developing countries. It increased in China, mm-hmm. it increased in India. But I would have to say in those countries, not so much India, but definitely China, the the aggregate gain was so great that Mm. I think on average people were still in favor of globalization. And it's still the case in most Asian countries. People are still very much pro-trade. And let me also add that despite all this backlash we see against globalization, there are still trade agreements being formed in other parts of the world. We had RCEP, uh, CPTPP, and so on. So so the backlash I'm talking about, as you said, Dan, is mostly about the advanced countries. But the reason this really matters is if you think about the United States or Britain, these were the champions of of free markets, of international trade, and the fact that they're stepping back Mm -hmm. is of significance in my view. You mentioned Africa. I think Africa is an entirely different story. And Africa as a continent has been left behind. As a continent, it did not benefit from globalization. And partly, I think, it's because it's not as connected to markets as as much as Asia Asia was. So if you want, I think what happened in Africa reinforces my point that globalization has been important for the reduction in global poverty. And the fact that we did not see huge improvements in Africa has to do, it's not the only reason, but also has to do with that Africa did not benefit from the exports that China or Vietnam or Bangladesh in Asia enjoyed. 
Now, Africa has a bunch of other issues as well, but in the context of trade, let me point out that African countries are highly segmented. Their internal markets are highly segmented. People will often tell you that you go from, to go from one African country to another, very often you have to go through Paris or London. Especially so, in West Africa. Especially <laughs> in West Africa. So even, you know, within the, the markets within a country are completely segmented. So there are very important market failures in Africa that have not been addressed. So the whole continent, I think, has been left behind. On top of that, there is another issue that you mentioned, that we talk about free trade and liberalization and you know, in general, this is all true, but many developing countries point out that some sectors that are important to them, and most importantly, agriculture, are still heavily protected. And this is something we need to keep in mind when we talk about liberalization or, you know, these days we talk a lot about protection in the name of national security. <laughs> and one of the sectors that, that has always been protected because of national security is the agricultural sector. Mm. It's heavily protected in Europe. This sector has never experienced the liberalization that other sectors enjoyed. And this is something that does affect developing countries, because especially in Africa, because this is where they have the comparative advantage. So this is a very valid complaint that these countries have. And it's definitely the case that a lot of things, there is room for, for a lot of progress there. And also I'm thinking, Penny, that there's sometimes a change in demand. So for example, think about this growing awareness about the harmful effects of tobacco. Now, mm -hmm. if you're a country where tobacco exports are very important, suddenly you're facing a problem, right? So what do you do then? How was it, say, for a typical African country in the beginning of, say, that globalization period, late 1990s, early 2000s, you had a lot of organizations, uh, IMF, World Bank, coming up with advice, etc. You know, this is how you can benefit. How is it for some of these countries versus some of the other countries you're talking about in Asia? What did the Asian countries, you think, did differently? Was it because the starting point was different, that there was greater integration across countries? One of the things I've been studying in Africa is, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, and why there's not greater manufacturing capacity. One of the arguments I hear from Indian or Chinese firms is the market sometimes is so small, we don't have a regulatory sort of agreement, we can't produce in one country, export it elsewhere. So, so it just becomes much cheaper to go to France or to India or to China. Is that one of the reasons that led to the problem as you alluded to in many parts of Africa versus it being better in Asia? There are many different reasons. I mean, every, every sector is different, but you know, you're raising a bunch of very interesting questions. I have a new, another paper, this is not in the book, but where together with Tristan Reed of the World Bank, we asked the question, how large does a market need to be to sustain development? And mm -hmm. we identify market size as being an important constraint to development. What we mean by that is that if you are a large country like China and India, trade and foreign markets are very important always, but you can also rely on yourself. Yeah, you the know, domestic because the market, market is big. The yeah? domestic market is big. Yeah. And one case where you see that you mentioned the pharmaceutical sector. So the pharmaceutical sector, as you know, has been quite successful in India. And it's a combination of having a large market and actually one instance of very successful industrial policy in India and, you know, the standard economists will criticize everything India did <laughs> in early years. The, the, the sector was heavily protected. But the fact is, it was a form of infant industry protection, and it led to a vibrant sector in India, the pharmaceutical sector. This never happened in Africa. As I mentioned, in Africa, even individual countries are highly segmented. There is no market there to sustain anything like that. There are many other differences. Take the skill level. In India, there is, especially, you know, two decades ago, there was still extreme poverty. There are huge inequalities. But there, there is also a very large share of population with high education. The same applies to Asian countries. Skills are a much more important constraint in many African countries. And then, of course, there is the, the issue of institutions, which we cannot play down. And again, there are huge issues in Africa with, with, with institutions, which play a very important role to development. Thank you.
there's something I see in the horizon that gives a lot of people a lot of hope. I'd like to hear your views, the African Free Trade Agreement, because one of the things you also point out in your book is how globalization impacted at the regional level, right? So mm-hmm. are you optimistic about the African Free Trade Agreement? Will it address some of these problems that you've just highlighted? It's a step in the right direction. What really worries me is the, I'm not very optimistic about the future, to be honest. Not because of what Africa does. I think this is the right move. It's because of what's happening in the rest of the world. And many advanced countries, including the United States, have turned inward. At the very same time, some big formerly developing countries, like China and India, are also turning inward for different reasons. I mean, China is engaging in this dual circulation strategy, which means rely on our domestic markets more than in the past. So what this means is there was this hope that countries in Africa could eventually export to China, maybe not to the United States or Europe, but China, as it becomes richer, would become a destination for all these countries. China is closing up right now. India has turned inward for different reasons. There is much more, there is a more nationalist direction in Indian policy. So it's not clear that these markets, these large lucrative markets that benefited Asian countries so much in the past are going to exist in the future. And I think that's a major challenge for Africa. What's the alternative? So at a very high level, at a very abstract level, China is a large continent. There are enormous gains from African countries cooperating among themselves. So if they, if they cannot rely on foreign lucrative markets, they're, they're still the regional markets that can potentially play a role in fostering development. So, so, so that's the only alternative I see. Let's then return to some of the reasons for the backlash in advanced economies, the backlash, the, the sort of disappointment with globalization. So obviously the financial crisis in 2007-8 was a big sort of landmark, you can say. And then you had growing disenchantment in some of these economies like the UK. Maybe there were some effects in the labor market, Mm -hmm. while at the same time, we were all as consumers loving the idea that we can get cheap stuff, football or clothes or whatever, items produced elsewhere. The variety was increasing, as you mentioned earlier, it was getting cheaper. So we loved all of that, but we were worried that we were losing our Mm -hmm. advantage that, you know, we were getting more and more unemployed. And that, as I understand it, led to a fed into this political narrative that some leaders had that we have to blame something and that was globalization. Mm -hmm. And then just to complete that order of things, we had the pandemic, which was really is it was sounding the alarm bell of, you know, now we need more protectionism because we need to produce masks in our local areas because we can't import them or they're so Mm -hmm. expensive. And we suddenly realized, oh my God, we were so dependent on China and others. uh, We need to be much more sort of uh, self-sufficient. So were some of these for you, some of these events or these landmarks more important than others? And how would you isolate the role of trade? Because as I understand Mm. it in the book, trade really did not decrease that much. Even during the pandemic, it maybe went down slightly in 2020, but it it was something else, right? Was it trade, technology, all of this? But I'm trying to understand the root causes of this disenchantment. I think this is something that is going to be debated for many years to come. Mm. And it's still puzzling. You know, the puzzle I put out is, Around 2016, which in my opinion marks the beginning of this new era, we have Brexit, we have the Brexit vote, and we have the election of Trump to the to the U.S. presidency. And then what follows is the tariffs of the U.S. against China, the retaliation of China. All this is happening at a time of relative prosperity, and I'm saying relative prosperity because not everyone is well off. But, but we're not in the midst of a recession. In the US at the time, we had full employment. The stock market was booming. Mm. It was a good time. So why then? And you mentioned the financial crisis. And what's interesting is after the financial crisis, we didn't see a backlash against globalization, even though people were disillusioned. But I think they were more disillusioned with capitalism than with globalization. I mean, there was this... 
increasing sentiment among the population that the rules of the game are not fair, that, that some people, <laughs> no matter what they do, they never pay the price. And the average person they pay the price for the mistakes others make. But so, is, is it the dissatisfaction with certain companies making enormous profits? But Where it was the- mostly financial companies. So in the US, it was about finance mm. and the huge profits that this that the financial sector made. Or, l- let me correct myself. Not the companies, but the executives of these companies. Mm-hmm. People were losing their homes. And at the same time, these executives were walking away with multi-million dollar packages. So there was a very strong sense of unfairness. Mm. But this was not at the time directed against globalization per se. Now, it could be that subconsciously things were changing, but it's really hard to put our finger on something concrete that was that has changed at that time. Then comes 2016, and again, we see all these arguments against trade. I think, in my opinion, what was happening is we were having an increase of these spatial inequalities, of these communities falling behind. We have the opioid crisis in the United States. We have the deaths of despair that um, Angus Deaton and Anne Case have written about. And these are not happening because of globalization. But if you actually look at the geography of these deaths, you know, where, where people commit suicide or they die from alcoholism, they are happening in all these areas that have experienced economic decline. So there is this sense that the geographical spectrum inequality is increasing. So I think that's feeding, that's all feeding into this anti-globalization sentiment. It's not globalization per se that's responsible for all this, but it's very it's very easy to blame foreign nationals for what's going on, whether it's immigrants or China. And then comes COVID. And, you know, when it comes to COVID, actually, in my opinion, the arguments against trade are totally misguided because actually trade during that time increase the resilience of the economy. It was not not a liability. It was great that we were trading with each other. And just to give you two concrete examples, take the vaccine. Of course, the vaccine had been developed many years. I mean, the, the basic science that led to the vaccine had been developed many years ago, and this is why the Nobel Prize That's in medicine correct. was given this year. However, the, the vaccine had to be manufactured within a short period of time. And as the CEO of Pfizer said, for the vaccine to be manufactured, you needed ingredients from 19 different countries. So in the midst of this chaos, where the global economy is shutting down, where we all have lockdowns, we are, we are not even allowed to leave our homes, not to mention, you know, go to work. And during that time, somehow we manage to get ingredients, to get the supplies from 19 different countries. So it's, it's an incredible story of international cooperation and how trading and exchanging with other countries helped us during that time. Another example, less popular, but it's true, you can see that in the data, is what happened with face masks. And yes, it's true that we experienced shortages for a few weeks, but then in the United States, most of the face masks that satisfy domestic demand came from China. Why? Because 80% of masks in the United States come from China, from one country. And in this particular case, China saved the day. So it's not true that trade made us worse off. So I think many of the arguments during that period were were caused by protectionists, but actually they don't stand up to scrutiny. That said, they did increase this view, this sentiment that trade is bad, globalization is bad. And then we have what uh, happens in 2022, the invasion in Ukraine, and that's, that, that starts a new chapter. That's when geopolitics enter the conversation. When we think about the U.S., at least some of the discourse within the U.S. against globalization, it is, as you point out, focused often exclusively on China. And the narrative is that it is unfair, that some countries are unfairly benefiting and others are not. Is it so, as many claim, that among all the countries that have benefited from globalization, China is number one? Is that is that true, Penny? Is that how we should view the the sort of the benefits that one country was able to reduce poverty by over half a billion people were lifted out of poverty? It is China. It is trade. And then the the narrative goes that China became richer, reduced poverty, and then adopted certain trade policies that were unfair to the United States. 
let me start by saying it's true that China benefited tremendously, but not only China, many other countries, mostly in Asia, you know, Korea, Vietnam, Malaysia, all the East Asian tigers, but even Latin America, if you take countries like Mexico, uh, there is no question in my mind that these countries benefited. And when people say China benefited the most, there is this zero-sum game thinking that dominates the debate today that if China benefited, then the rest of us must have lost. Mm. This is not how it works in trade. I mean, one of the big insights in trade is that there is the potential for everyone to be made better off. China can be better off and the United States can be better off. That said, there, there are also many elements in this argument that are true. And what is true about China is the following, that when China first entered the world trading system, it was a very poor country. They were doing some things that we might have issues with, take the support of state-owned enterprises, you know, the subsidies of their own, intellectual property theft, which even they acknowledge is going on. I think the United States and many other countries were willing to look the other way because it was a very poor developing country. In the meantime, China became much wealthier. Now, let me emphasize, it's still a poor country. <laughs> the per capita income is still very low, but it's a country of 1.6 billion people where there has been tremendous growth in the last two decades. So if you look at the GDP of China today, it has become the world's second economy. So even though the per capita incomes are low with China as a whole, you know, if you add up the, the wealth of all, the, of, of all its people, it's a formidable economic power. So now the, the United States and many other countries want China to follow the same rules as everyone else. And one specific instance is opening up its markets to Western companies. It doesn't seem fair that our markets are completely open to Chinese imports. And as I said, we benefit from that. But Chinese markets are closed to American companies. If American companies or European companies want to do business in China, and most of them want to do so because it's a very large market, then they very often have to turn over intellectual property or engage in joint ventures. Uh, they have to pay a price. And you hear many companies saying, well, we know we have to pay this price, but China is so large that it's not good for us to stay out of the market. So that's where I think China's size gives China a unique advantage. This is not something that Vietnam can say or you know, Somalia or any other country say, come to us. However, you can only come to us if you turn over your technology to us. Then the, the US companies would say, no thanks. They can say that to Malaysia or, so, or you know, Vietnam. They will not say that to China. They have not said that to China for many years. So this is where things are asymmetric. And that's where I'm very sympathetic to the arguments that many Western companies have. And I think these are, these are important arguments. To what extent then do you sympathize with what Trump was saying in 2016 while he was campaigning, but also during his time as president? Because it was quite popular to say, you know, he does not know what he's doing, etc. Was there any merit to some of his criticism? Because it sounds like you, you agree with some of the stuff that he was saying then. I don't think, first of all, that the tariffs he imposed addressed any of these issues, but all these issues had been raised already during the Obama administration. It was not Trump okay. who mentioned them first. I mean, the, the U.S. had made them clear, and, and you know, Europe as well. I, I think what was uh, uh, objectionable during the Trump years is the tone of the conversation. It's one thing to raise issues about Chinese policies or even, you know, about the challenges that immigration poses for a country, and immigration does pose challenges, and another one to just to blame China for every problem that the U.S. has, to call all immigrants rapists or criminals. It's the tone and the rhetoric that was different. And words matter, and they matter a lot when they come from the mouth of the, of the president of the, number one, of the number one economy of the world. So, so the tone of the conversation was very different. And in terms of policies, I think the policies he implemented were ineffective. I don't think that tariffs really changed anything. What they did change is the political climate, and they escalated all tensions with China. So can you help us understand how the tariff system works? So when one accuses others of being unfair, what is it that a country has in its arsenal 
what are the different strategies that one as a politician can enact? Make it more expensive for that country, that other country you don't like, to, to export their goods into our country? Is, is that the, the biggest sort of strategy or the weapon that one has? So the traditional weapon was for the country to appeal to the World Trade Organization. And as a multilateral institution, the World Trade Organization tried to, to be the objective judge in these international conflicts that came up all the time. Now, if the World Trade Organization found that in, in the, indeed this trade practice that one particular country was engaging in was unfair, the other country had the right to impose countervailing duties. Now, the U.S. did not go through this process. It imposed tariffs unilaterally. The U.S. had taken many actions to completely disempower the World Trade Organization. That was the beginning of the of dismantling of the world multilateral system. What happened is, as I said, is we, we had the U.S. tariffs, the retaliation of China. All this led to an escalation of economic tensions between the two countries and eventually also political tensions between these two countries. And that's why they are so significant. There have been economic effects of these actions. We can we saw the prices, the consumer prices in the United States rising during this time for the goods that saw big tariff increases. But I would say these this price increases were not large enough to matter in the aggregate. They were there, but they were not major. What did change is the political climate, and that was important. One topic that got a huge amount of press coverage in developing countries in South Africa and India was the TRIPS waiver. They uh, wanted an exception, these two countries, saying that they would like to manufacture vaccines, right? Mm -hmm. And they were not allowed to. And there was this feeling that was strengthened as the pandemic went on. It was the West versus the rest. The rich countries were hoarding the vaccines. They were manufacturing yeah. it. It was expensive. What they were giving other countries was just uh, stuff that they did not want or close to the expiry date. There was actually, coming to think of it, that reaction against, if you were to say globalization, uh, some of these countries are saying, give us the patents and so we could manufacture yeah. on our own. What was your take on that? So first, let me say I'm on record for being against the TRIPS agreement, not in the context of COVID, but mm -hmm. even you know back in 2015. And the reason is, I mean, we all think that inte respecting intellectual property is important. Uh, for every country, including the developing countries. But I had made the argument, along with every economist I know, that complete harmonization of the policies between developing and developed countries was not called for. And it, it, it was going to have detrimental economic effects. So I'm very much in favor of TRIPS waivers, especially when you have a, a health emergency. That said, for the case of COVID, I don't believe that a waiver would have solved the problem. And the reason is there were incredible shortages of raw materials, of supplies to manufacture the vaccines. One needed, you know, these raw ingredients, expertise, skill, know-how to manufacture the vaccines. There were many bottlenecks, even at experienced companies in the West. So having new companies enter in India or in South Africa, enter this race to produce the vaccine, would have just slowed down the process even further. So in principle, yes, you want pharmaceuticals production to take place all over the world. In that particular instance, that action would not have helped. What would have helped, I think, is to have some agreements for vaccine purchases by developing countries at the outset. So, so what happened with the vaccine purchases is the rich countries made agreements with the companies in advance. They committed, they pre-committed to purchasing vaccines, certain, a certain quantity of vaccines, no matter what the success would be. And that gave the companies the confidence, but also the financial means to start production. But once they produced them, then the rich countries came first. The developing countries never entered such an agreement, partly because they didn't have the financial means to do that. 
and you know you would hear many people in this country saying our problem is not COVID, our problem is poverty. We we just don't have the resources to commit to these purchases. So by not having made these advanced purchases, when the vaccine was finally produced, they were last on the list. You know, I understand where this anguish comes from. But on the other hand, uh, this is not a case where a trips whoever would have helped at that point, right? Uh, what would have helped is having some organization like COVAX you know, act on behalf of these countries. And eventually COVAX did it, but Co- even COVAX did it late and faced major financial constraints, major funding constraints for a very long time. So having the funding there for these countries to make these advanced purchases would have made all the difference. And this is something that we should take into account going forward because this may happen again and we may be in the same situation and one needs to be ready. So if this happens again, what should happen in developing countries? I think there should be a facility that's ready to make these advanced purchases on their behalf from the very beginning. So Penny, let's move on to then multilateralism. You've been writing about climate change. I'm thinking about your background as the former chief economist of the World Bank Group. You've been, I'm sure, in many, many interesting meetings and interactions Mm -hmm. thinking about the future of multilateralism. Many people argue that multilateralism is in crisis. It's been in crisis all the time. There are countries, there are people losing faith The pandemic was just one, perhaps, reason why people were thinking that, well, we're not Mm. collaborating enough. We have the war in the Ukraine. Even the UN is seen to be Mm. often very ineffective. And I'm thinking about some of the biggest challenges of our time, climate disruption, and how we should actually address this. You see that just a few weeks ago in New York, your home city, you know, all these world leaders came and uh, there was a lot of discussion, Mm. but... It's still not clear how countries can be pushed to make ambitious targets, goals, and actually implement them. There's still this this idea that some countries will still rely on fossil fuels and mm-hmm. we can't really make the transition. And I have to mention here, Penny, I'm, I'm seeing many of my African colleagues saying, why is it that Africa is always singled out that the West wants Africa to move directly into renewables, whereas... The big economies, including India and China, still rely on coal. Mm. It's like Africa has to be the first out, take all the risks. Mm. So my question to you is, when you think about these huge challenges, climate change being number one, how do you see multilateralism addressing it? Where is it that we've got it wrong? So so I'm a big believer in multilateralism. And, And let me say at the outset, part of the reason I'm such a big believer is I come from a small country. I come from Greece. The biggest beneficiaries of the multilateral system were the small countries. The big countries can negotiate among themselves. (laughs) The the little ones have zero negotiating power. So it's the multilateral system is the system that really protects them. So I'm, 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 I'm a very, I'm a big believer in that system. That said, I think it can often lead to paralysis. And we saw that to a certain extent with the World Trade Organization in previous years, back when the, the rule was that you know, in order to reach agreement, every single country had to agree on every single provision of a trade agreement. It became a straitjacket. No one could agree on anything. And as the World Trade Organization grew, it became, if you want, the victim of its own success because it became an organization that included many heterogeneous countries with many different preferences and priorities. So eventually that led to paralysis. And my fear is that with climate change, we may end up with the same when we just push for a truly multilateral solution. As you mentioned, that we have countries with completely different resources and priorities. So I agree with Africa. You know, why do we put so much pressure on small African countries when the big polluters are the United States, China, Europe, and in the future, India? And of course, this spans the whole world, but it's a handful of places and we should start with those. And so I think multilateralism can, to a certain extent, be also used as an excuse to do nothing. And you hear this argument a lot in the United States. People say, oh, it's a global public good. The others don't do anything, therefore we don't do 
we don't need to do anything. I think as a large country, you owe it to the world <laughs> to be the first. It's very difficult so, to convince the people there saying, or, you know, you have to make a sacrifice for somebody in a distant country to benefit, right? That's true. But, you know, in the United States, I would say people are rich enough to realize this is for ourselves. You know, it's good for everyone wants to, to breathe clean air and clean and drink clean water. And more importantly, you want your children and grandchildren to, to have a life, to have a future, which is questionable at this point. So I think it's easier to make this case in a rich country like the United States than it is to make it in a poor country. But what's the problem? The problem is that the United States is energy independent, has huge reserves of oil and gas. So it's very hard. The political economy is very tricky. It's very hard to tell people pay a price now for the good of the world or for the good of future generations. It's easier to make this point in Europe that's not energy independent, or even in China. China has coal, but coal is very dirty. But China is importing oil. So they do have some incentive to promote renewables compared, let's say, to the United States. And then, of course, you have the, you know, the, the oil producing countries that have zero interest in that, including Russia. India is a tricky case because India relies on coal, which is extremely dirty. It's also a country where extreme poverty still exists. And you will hear people say, I don't care about green energy. <laughs> I care about growth. I care about eliminating poverty. And I think these arguments should be taken seriously. It's, it's, I do respect them when they come from people in India who say, I don't care about the future when I have no present. So I don't think there is an easy solution, but I do think that if we want to make progress in climate change, we have to be willing in the rich parts of the world to pay the higher price. And we, we, should, be, we should be willing to actually to, to, to pay this price. There's been quite a lot of debate in this country because we produce so much oil and gas. And we, of course, are mm -hmm. making a lot of money following yeah. the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We are exporting gas and oil and mm -hmm. making money like like never before. Yeah. So we are obviously benefiting. And um, I recall again, just a few weeks ago during the UN General Assembly, the UN Secretary General invited certain countries that were making all the right noise about, you know, uh, ending their reliance on fossil fuels to a special meeting. And our prime minister was not invited. And he thought it was a little odd because <laughs> he felt that, you know, Norway was doing all the right things. But the the, the sad reality is that, of course, we we wish to continue oil exploration and gas for the next few decades, mm -hmm. I think. In some parts of the world, including ours, you know, we may implement certain policies with good intentions like, you know, mainstreaming electric cars, providing subsidies, mm -hmm. making it cheaper for people to buy them. And yet we may feel comfortable exporting our pollution elsewhere. And then mm -hmm. there's this other debate I'd like to hear your views on in this part of the world which often does not resonate in Africa and Asia, and that is in terms of degrowth. Obviously, some people would, most people would say we should consume less. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's good for us to reduce consumption of meat. We should not be flying that much. But there is, among some groups of people, this, this thing that, well, we need to really shrink the economy. What is your take on degrowth? And do you think that can have a positive impact? Is it is it feasible at all? Of course it's feasible. So let me give you one example, Afghanistan, the greenest country of the world. If you go back to the Middle Ages, <laughs> you, can, you can practice degrowth and be green. And I don't think any of us want that. But let me put it this way. Is it perhaps advisable to slow down growth in countries like Norway <laughs> or the United States? In my book, yes. I mean, policymakers are obsessed with growth. This is the only thing they talk about. But growth towards what? After all, what we don't care about what GDP is in a country. We care about the quality of life is. And the quality of life is measured by more than GDP. There is the quality of the air you breathe, of the water you drink. There is the time you spend with family and friends. There is happiness, if you want, in general. At, at some point, it's clear that this is not just a function of GDP. As you become richer and richer, I don't want to downplay the, the role of economic wealth. Obviously, I'm an economist. Economic wealth is important. And there's a lot of research that shows that happiness and economic well-being are 
positively correlated. But at some point, you have enough to be happy and, and you can think about more than just income. And, and so um, I won't call it degrowth, but perhaps slowing down growth makes a lot of sense in those parts of the world that are incredibly rich already. And that can be done by reducing our consumption, not wanting to import cheap products because they're cheap? I would say we can avoid ostentatious consumption. Mm -hmm. Why do we need three cars or two houses or anyone who has lived in the United States knows how goods arrive at your home, what the packaging materials look like. It's an incredible waste. So can we make life more sustainable? My answer is yes. But at the same time, we have to realize that it's a very different story in those parts of the world that are not rich yet. Uh, in those parts of the world where there is still extreme poverty. And that applies to many African countries. It applies to India, not to everyone, to South Asia in general. There are parts of the population who still live in extreme poverty. And telling these people, uh, talking you know, in these in, in this parts of the world about degrowth, is totally irresponsible, in my view. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a new form of colonialism, and we have to acknowledge that. I, I think there have to be two different tracks there. That said, when I was at the World Bank, I don't know how many times I've heard the statement by policymakers you know, from, from developing countries. Our priority is growth. First, we'll grow fast in the next five to ten years. And then once we've made it, then we can clean up. And after all, this is what rich countries did. And just think how wasteful this is. You know, first you pollute everything around you in order to grow, and then you spend the next 10 years to clean up if this is feasible. You would think that it's a, there should be a way to avoid this first phase where you just make everything around, around you dirty. So again, having a conversation about that, trying to find the means to do that, I think this is worthwhile. But... Once again, we would have as as rich in the in, in those parts of the world that are rich, we have to be willing to pay the price for it. I don't think it's fair to ask the African countries or India to pay the price. So I think some of these activists, uh, often the degrowth people, say that it's degrowth in our parts, the richer parts. We don't want. We're not saying degrowth in poorer countries. But what I'm always worried about is by say, reducing the imports of certain goods that these other countries are dependent mm -hmm. on, exporting to us. Yeah. We, our market suddenly becomes smaller and we make it difficult for those countries to grow and thereby get the revenue for poverty reduction. So what we do in our parts of the world also have a very important effect on these other countries because we are all co we're connected, right? That's where yeah, we yeah. started the conversation with globalization. What we do here will impact also Absolutely. countries that are exporting to us. Absolutely. And that's why I think the CBAM, so the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, is fraught with problems. It, it seems a just mechanism. It seems consistent with economics principles, but it's going to be a, a severe penalty on many countries that rely on these goods, rely on the export of these goods to uh, rich economies. And I'm not even sure that these, these type of goods account for a significant share of worldwide emissions. Yes, you do have palm oil in Indonesia, but do you think if Indonesia did not produce palm oil anymore, we would be significantly better off? I, I don't think so. That's where, again, I come to the issue, who are the climate elephants? And it's coal in India. It's coal in China. So let's start with those before we penalize every country in the world. Now, for the rest of the world, there could be, there could be a slow process. I mean, we, 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 we should try to decarbonize, but we could do that slowly, giving them time to adjust. And there is a lot of work that shows that actually trade and multinationals have played a positive role in that process. So multinationals may actually locate their dirtiest facilities in developing countries, as you would expect, in mm -hmm. countries with no environmental standards. But over time, they have an incentive to clean up, you know, partly because they have centralized logistics system or centralized procedures, partly because there is a lot of pressure from the consumers in their own countries to clean up. So yes, in the short run, they do all these things that seem abhorrent, <laughs> But then in the long run, there, there are actually positive effects. So little by little, we can spread these clean technologies all over the world.
I, I'm just worried that when we try to push for these technologies over a short period of time, this is going to have detrimental effects on, on the wealth and the development of these countries. Penny, I have to ask you, given your background as the chief economist of the World Bank, I actually have had the current chief economist in the same chair as you are. Indomit was here a few months ago. Now, one of the arguments I hear from some of my friends in Washington is that the World Bank is trying to do too many things now is um, doing development, poverty reduction, mm -hmm. which is the main mission, but is also trying to be a leader in, in climate change. And this is something that you and I discussed in the car from the airport yesterday. So uh, for the benefit of my listeners, how do you see the World Bank going forward in addressing not just poverty and economic development, but also climate change? Should it focus on one and not do everything at the same time? Or can it do everything at the same time? So I think the World Bank is one organization that prides itself in having always reinvented itself in response to, to current global challenges. And so it cannot possibly ignore climate change. I mean, this is something that is affecting economic welfare in almost every developing country. So it cannot simply ignore it. I still think that poverty reduction should remain its priority. And it's perhaps the one organization that, that should be saying the things I'm saying right now, that, that, that there is actually a trade-off between addressing climate change right away and growth and development in some low-income countries. It should acknowledge that this trade-off exists. It's not always win-win, uh, which it, is often the narrative. It's not always win-win. There is a trade-off there. And I, I think it's in the perfect position to try to address the trade-off, whatever means it has. So I think it can potentially play a very important role in this whole debate. Penny, it was such a pleasure to have you in the basement today. Thank you so much for this lovely conversation. No, thank you again. It was a pleasure talking to you. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo. Please email your questions, comments and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.